Fraud is big. Fraud is really big. I mean, it's £48 billion worth of big. It's a department, it's MOD. And it's so hard. Because governments, unlike any other part of the private sector, you can't take a private sector thing and put it into government. There's no single panacea, there's no cure that you can just apply immediately across the whole of government. There's no big solution for fraud. It's very complex. So, about four or five years ago, John Manzoni, CEO of government, stood up in front of a crowd of interested fraud people in government and said to them, bring your fraud projects, we'll work with you on this, we'll help you through it. And we were overwhelmed by the silence. Nothing. <laughs> and we were curious, we were curious, because fraud is big. So why were people not using data as part of addressing fraud? So we ran a survey, a couple of surveys, and we got some answers back. So what we found out is that some departments don't recognise they have fraud and have no analysts. Some departments recognise they have fraud and have no analysts. Some departments recognise they've got fraud and have analysts. And some departments don't recognise they've got analysts and don't recognise they've got fraud. So, DBPH must see recognise fraud and have analysts. Um, there are other groups in that don't recognise fraud at all and therefore have no need for analysts. We were looking at two groups, ones who recognised they had fraud but had no analysts to support the work. And those ones who had analysts had recognised the fraud but couldn't quite bring the two together. So, we basically looked at what was happening with those two areas and what we heard were three things. So, I can't say I want, can't share data, I won't share data. Um, well, I would if I could and I will but I'm just not sure how. So, what we did is we recognised there was little understanding of data as an asset in government. So we had an organisational context, we had a huge capability challenge of some people who should be using analytics to counter fraud just not having the ability to do that. We had data not being recognised as an asset, people were not really understanding the value of data to counter fraud. And we had legislative challenges. So, what do we do about it? Well, we changed the law. So, <laughs> and there's no fraud anymore. Great, and go. Um, so, we introduced the Digital Economy Act. The Digital Economy Act gave an explicit power for departments subscribing to that act to share data to counter fraud. It got rid of those arguments people say, oh, the DPA stops me. It never did, it never would. It told you how to do it should you want to. But this, for the first time, gave an explicit power, permissive, to allow data to be shared. So we get rid of those, why well, can't, so I won't. And we recognise there was no big answer. Um, government can't take a private sector solution and apply it to government. The fact that a bank or a credit card company or a finance company will look at you, risk you and say, oh, a bit risky, we can't touch you. If you are an unemployed fraudster, you are still an unemployed fraudster. We have to give you a benefit. We might understand the risk in doing that, but we still have to apply it. So what we did is we focused on specific fraud problems. We recognised there was no big panacea, no big solution. We developed small agile statistical pilots with departments, bringing together a community of people interested in tackling fraud. We developed an access to tools and capabilities to allow departments to do that, and we passed that learning on. So, we wanted to tackle those who said, well, I will, but I'm not sure how. So we put in place a small team of analysts and project managers within my group, so I run them. About four staff, we do seven to eight pilots a year, you're looking at our delivery from last year. Each one of these take about 18 to 24 uh, weeks to run. So the Digital Economy Act took a process that if you needed legislation to share data to counter fraud, it would take you about two years to put that in place. The Digital Economy Act takes about six weeks, but keeps parliamentary accountability. A minister must approve that data share. We took piloting processes that, again, often would take a year and a half, two years, and we brought it down to 18, 24 weeks. The importance is we take a statistically significant sample, that's hard to say when you have got a dry mouth, um, and we find the fraud in the system. So we use that to find the fraud in the whole system, and then we look at, within the pilot, investigating the frauds that are there. So you can see that um, last year we found about £17.5 million pounds worth of fraud just in the pilots alone. A team of four people, seven pilots run throughout the year, across um, the devolved administrations, so Scotland's involved in it, Northern Ireland's involved in it as well. Um, six government departments involved in that. Um, we recognise within the system about £117 million worth of fraud. So it can be done. Now, the next challenge we face is that, um, well, I would if I could. So we're in the game of fishing. We want to teach people to use data analytics to counter fraud. The challenge we have is teaching them how. So we developed a best practice guide. 
The best practice guide gives a workflow of how you tackle a counter-fraud analytical project. It tells you the processes to use, it tells you when to call in analysts. So the workflow is broken down to the stages you would ordinarily use within a process. There's a text box process, it talks about the people and the processes you would use to counter fraud. What we also did was we linked this with a capability matrix. So this told you at what stage to involve an analyst, what type of analyst you need, and what type of analytics you might want to apply at that stage. I, I don't want to use idiot's guide, but I'll leave that for you to judge. Um, we were, however, too successful. We found, in some cases, too much fraud. <laughs> um, the challenge we have is that fraud in government can be quite expensive. And you can't prosecute your way out of this problem. Although it's important for government, if you look at police forces and their priorities in local crime, it could be stabbings, it could be drugs. Fraud isn't high up the agenda quite often, and it's understandable why it's not. It's not perhaps so much of a social problem. So for those departments who can't prosecute, there's a real challenge in finding it. So we're looking at a different approach. We recognise that you can't prosecute the of fraud. So we look at the focus on fraud prevention. We look at the focus on developing capability across government. Now, at this end, you get intelligence gathering, you get investigations. We have a lot of these people in government. DBP, HMRC, I think, have some region of three to 6,000 people involved in intelligence and investigations and the analytics behind that. What we don't have, and you see it in the banking sector and other sectors, is people in the end of data analytics and fraud analytics looking at fraud. What we've found is we've got stacks of economists, masses of them. We've got statisticians. We've got operational researchers. They do not point towards fraud. So, um, last year we released a profession, and what we're doing now is linking into that profession, and for the first time ever in government, we are creating a standard for counter-fraud analytics. So to finish, we talked about the data mindset. We talked about not recognising fraud as an asset. We've taken steps to challenge that. We've taken steps to give people the products to allow them to start to do fraud projects. We are developing government's capability. We're bringing them board the profession. We've given them a toolkit, which is the, business, the best practice guide, to start to develop this. We want to take it further. We've got a thought paper out at the moment where we've gone out to the public, to the private sector, to academia, and said, how can we address these next challenges facing government? How can we make sure we're doing it ethically? How can we access more data? How can we address data quality and improve government data mindset? Now, I'm happy to finish there ahead of time. Thank you, Graham. Um, next set of questions. We've got one at the door. We've got one down here. Uh, any others in the first batch? Great. Let's get started with those two. Hi there. Um, Andy Bennett, Register Dynamics. So we, we did some work with, the, with, with GDS and the Cabinet Office where we were trying to work out what the fraud rates were in services. And we found that people were really hesitant to measure fraud because as soon as they measure it, it goes up and that bad, looks bad for them. So how do, you, how, 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 what, how do you deal with the social side of f tackling fraud? How do you get people to engage with this and actually admit that they have any fraud at all in the first place, or even look to see if they have any fraud? Thank you. And then down here as well. Thank you. Uh, I'm Joe Dilga, so Data Protection Officer, University of Winchester. Um, and uh, you mentioned uh, about the Digital Economy Act in terms of explicit power to share data within government. I wondered if there were still challenges for, for government, cabinet office and so on, in terms of having data shared with government from outside government, and whether you had a view in terms of ICO's new draft data sharing code of practice out for consultation at the moment, whether that would help in, in terms of clarity, in terms of data sharing, because from my perspective it does, in terms of making it clearer that it's a lot easier and safer where it's legitimate and reasonable to do so, for example, to share data with the police for law enforcement purposes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm interested in this thing. Thank you. Right, I'll talk really slowly now and just waste some more time. <laughs> um, to come to your first point, so I think it's a very valid point. I work uh, as a small group within a much larger group, which is the fraud and area uh, within Cabinet Office under Mark Cheeseman. <laughs> Um, there are other disciplines within that group, so um, government departments are required to report into us on how they're adhering to the counter-fraud standards. 
Um, government departments have to have a kind of fraud strategy and have to have an action plan to address the, the fraud that they should be recognising. So we are really, through that group, starting to change the mindset of government and saying actually finding fraud is a good thing. It shows you've got a grasp of your finances. It shows you're aware of the fraud that's happening there. Um, we know on average from the work that we've done and from the fraud measurement assurance pieces within the other part of Mark's area that we do there, which looks at business, business processes and identifies what fraud may be, may be within the process, the departments should be finding about 1, 1.5 to 5% of fraud. And if they're not, the challenge is it's there, you're not finding it. Um, so we are starting to get that move. Uh, there's another piece of work that Mark was involved in, which uh, was about the bravery and corruption. Um, so under bravery and corruption, I'm not sure it was an act yet, Mark will give me a kicking on that one. Um, but uh, every department now has to have a senior civil servant who is responsible and accountable for within that department. So we're really starting to get our teeth into, you do have fraud, you will recognise it and you'll manage it. Does that answer your question? Okay, thanks much. Um, coming back to you is yes and yes. Um, I, I have to say, I think, I think I can see this. So I believe the code of practice that ICO are developing is quite closely tied in with the one that's developed in the back of the DEA. That actually what they saw was a lot of good practice. And I think there's been a lot of work with the DEA team and ICO and bringing together the ICO code of practice. I have never seen the DPA as been a problem for anybody. I've always seen it as an enabler to get fraud. People would say, oh, I can't, it's a DPA. And I've never taken that as an excuse. So I think clarity in the GDPR can only help us move towards better data sharing and more improved data sharing. Answer your question? Yeah, um, I, I think uh, there's not necessarily much clarity in the GDPR about data sharing. I think if you acknowledge your work, you can pull it out in yeah, terms you can. of local basis for processing personal data. But I think the ICO has draft data sharing code of practice, even though it's a draft, it basically says this is a good summary from the ICO of the law yeah. on data sharing. And what, what we try and do with our work is we have a kind of fraud forum where we try and share the approaches that we're using. We try and share where someone has done a, a data share, um, understand the analysis that they use, understand the data they use, understand the value of that. And we also understand how the, the data sharing agreement would be set up and what challenges there were. So for us, it's also about building that platform upon which others can build new projects and new pilots, having accepted what's gone previously. Okay? Yep. Thank you. Uh, next set of questions. <laughs> Uh, one right at the back. Any more? And you've got one, whole, you've got one right down at forty-five theatre. Hi, uh, uh, Matt Kellogg from a different bit of the cabinet office. Um, as I, uh, as you said, and as I know, your work on Ford sits in a wider Ford area and, yeah. and, and uh, group. I, the the numbers are sort of generally the case that error is actually a much larger sort of component of all our sort of Ford and error totals. But um, so I was just wondering, sort of. And this is obviously really important, but I wonder how much learning is there that could be transferred across to that much bigger bit of sort of uh, the Ford and Error pile, in a sense, from, from the work you've been doing. Thank you. And we've got a question right down here in the second row as well. Uh, Stuart Holland from Equifax. Um, mine was on what comes next, so the thought paper is great. I've seen John Manzoni promoting it in Civil Service World. Um, which will increase the engagement. I just wondered um, what comes next in that program of work. Thank you. Uh, okay, to come to your point. Um, certainly through the work that we do, we, we see for and error together. Um, the, the challenge you're probably aware is that everything really sits in the NSV until you can prove intent. Uh, and therefore, we certainly just look upon it as one area of there's fraud and error going on here. Um, we would do work through the pilots. We do try and push it towards uh, identifying how much is actually fraud and how much is actually error. And we do that through an investigation and compliance piece, but often that's a much longer process. Um, again, working with other part of Mark's area, a lot of what you do to counter fraud will counter error. So we do try and work more broadly across and take the principles and learning we get from the fraud and look at actually can that help address the error within the processes, business processes that, that we see. Uh, most of the pilots that we are working on, although we focus often on fraud, and the DEA would have you focus on fraud, that's what it's set up for. Um, the learning there allows you to tackle the error that makes it in the system through the same process. So it, there's a lot of symbiosis between the two that sort of transfers across, um, just looking at time-wise. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, so for us, the, the thought paper is a start of a process. Um, it was designed not as a, a consultation, because actually what we wanted to understand was what were the particular issues. Um, the diagram I showed prior to this one, which I think was that one, gives you kind of break down the structure of the thought paper. Um, it's set up that way so people can go, actually, ethics is my thing, so I can raise a question ethics, or the whole bank's my thing, or data quality is an issue, and I want to focus on that. Um, what we will do is we're waiting for the, um, the input from that. Um, I have to say I was, I was dismayed. I spoke to Sam Smith, um, who's someone in the audience. Yay, there's Sam there. 
Um, Sam was heavily involved in the DEA when it was developed. Um, we've had a lot of people come back from industry tell us we should do more to share data. Uh, and oddly enough, they've got the tools to help us. Um, what, what we haven't really heard from is the private sector, uh, sorry, the public um, and academia. So I was quite glad to actually find Sam today, um, because Sam will be quite vocal. Uh, and we're pushing it out to see actually we want to hear from everybody. We want to hear what's right, what's wrong, what we can do. Once that comes in, we're going to compile it. We're going to have a look at what that says. Um, we've, we're going to set up a, a group, um, again, to work with us and understand what we do with it next. Uh, and then ideally, if we feel there is a motion that needs to be challenged more strongly or presented more strongly, we'll talk to the Minister about how we handle that and progress with it. Um, does, that, does that help? The answer is we haven't seen what comes back with the thought paper yet. We don't quite know what we're going to do. But there's a process in place to take it further. Any more? Any more? Fantastic. 27, 26, 25, 24, 23, 26, 25. Um, Very quick question there. Sorry, we'll come to you next time. Uh, Jamie Patton, another bit of the Cabinet Office. Um, just wondering whether um, departments have the right financial incentives to effectively detect fraud and manage it. If they do and do it well, do they get to retain in their own budgets or does it go back to Treasury? So that is quite complex. It will depend upon where it's found within the budget. Um, in some instances, it goes back to Treasury. Um, in some instances, it's retained within the budget. So classically, we have problems where there isn't necessarily a loss of service. So some of the um, tenancy. I think expressed it this way, a local authority might have a certain amount to pay for five tenants, four of which are fraudulent. When they find those fraudulent tenants, they can then pay for another four tenants who aren't fraudulent. So that money doesn't necessarily come back, but it's not necessarily lost. I mean, an accountant would get, get me in that one, get into more complexities behind it. Um, there is certainly a challenge when we look at the um, business case of piloting. Um, it's very difficult to put a business case behind counter fraud, because uh, fraud prevention is quite a hard thing to measure. Um, at this moment in time, we are developing methodology um, within my team where we're trying to develop a framework for the benefits piece. We're trying to get through the HMT. It might not happen this year through HMT, where we can accept as a standard methodology for government that we can use for prevention pilots and kind of for pilots where the benefits can be recognised and realised. But it's a complex area that ties a whole into government finances, which is not my expert field. Graham, thank you very much. Thank you.